appreciate that. Well, let's stand. And if I say Christ is risen, you would say? He is risen All right. So that was practice. So here we go. Christ is risen. He is risen Oh, Oh, that's that, that. No, that's like dress rehearsal. Let's go. Christ is risen. He is risen Amen. Now that's better. That's more like it. Listen, if you have your Bibles, open them to the Gospel of John, chapter 20, beginning at verse 11. And we'll read through. <laughs> we'll read through. See, you like doing that. Okay. We'll read through verse 18. And then we also want to look at 2 Corinthians 5, 17. <clears throat> Let me say, if you're without your Bible this morning, that's fine, because you can follow the text by looking at the screen behind me, or the screens behind me, and you follow as I read, beginning with John chapter 20 and verse 11. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. And at this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned around and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he has said these things to her. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. The Lord will bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. If you're in my age bracket, then I imagine that you attended Sunday school at some point in your life. And if you did attend Sunday school, then you'll remember this chorus. It started like this. Jesus loves me, this I know, for... Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Now, when I was growing up, we accepted the Bible as the authority. We trusted what it said. But in today's culture, the culture has put the Bible on the level of tales and legends, a book that's full of exaggerations. So I want to clear that up this morning. First of all, the Bible is not just one book, it's a library of books. 66 books in the Bible, 66 books written by 40 authors over 1,500 years. Okay, just get those numbers in your mind. 66 books in the Bible written over by 40 authors over 1,500 years. And here's the amazing thing. Every book that was written by each one of those 40 authors over 1,500 years, every book points to one person and one person only, and his name is Jesus. Everything points to Jesus. The Bible is filled with historical narratives, the poetry, biographies. In fact, in the New Testament, we have the first four books are biographies of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Historians say that it takes two sources. If you have two sources that agree on an event, that the reliability of that event is greatly enhanced. Well, we not only have two sources, we have four eyewitness accounts, four biographies of Jesus Christ. 
And these accounts are based on eyewitness testimonies that are corroborated by sources outside of the biblical record. The Gospels are historically accurate. So what I'm talking to you about this morning, the things that I'm bringing forward to you this morning, they happened. They really happened. I'm not just wishing they happened. I'm not just saying them because I want you to feel good on this Easter Sunday morning. I'm telling you this because they really happened. Amen. And because the Holy Spirit inspired those authors as to what to write and what to record, then we know that what we read here is God's Word. And because it is God's Word, that means that it is as alive and vibrant today as when that first word was written by that first Holy Spirit inspired author. And that also means that I can take the truth of that book and apply it to my life and expect changes to occur in me and through me. If you agree with that, say something. Right. Listen to me. What we're talking about happened and we can expect something to occur in our lives. This morning I want to talk to you about one of the eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Mary Magdalene. Who was Mary Magdalene? And why is it important to tell her story, especially on the biggest Sunday of the year? Mary Magdalene. We know her, but we don't know her. Her name is familiar to Christians and non-Christians alike. There have certainly been enough tales written about her. Some say that she was a prostitute at some point in her life. There is nothing in the Bible that supports that. Frequently, people identify her with the story that we see in the scriptures of the sinful woman that anointed Jesus' feet with ointment and then wiped his feet with her hair. There is nothing in the scriptures that would give us a clue that that was Mary Magdalene. At times, Mary Magdalene is confused with Lazarus and Martha's sister, Mary. But biblically, Mary Magdalene and Mary of Bethany were two different people. Some believe that she was the one who wrote the fourth gospel. That she, instead of John, was the beloved disciples. Friends, there is nothing to support that except maybe the Da Vinci Code. But the Da Vinci Code is fiction. Do we understand that? All right then. Well, she wasn't a prostitute. And she probably didn't anoint Jesus' feet. And we know she didn't write a gospel. So why, what do we know about her? And why is it that she's mentioned in all four resurrection accounts? Let me start by saying that we don't know a lot of things that we wish we knew, but we do know one very important thing. Mary was radically transformed by Jesus Christ. She was transformed, remade, recreated. And friends, that is the message of the resurrection. Easter changes everything. The fact that Jesus rose from the dead changes everything. But before I say much more, why not hear from Mary herself? So we're going to have Mary Magdalene come. Every day for me was dark, really dark. I wasn't the kind of woman that you would want to be friends with. Everyone in my town was afraid of me. I was afraid of me. You see, 
I heard voices all the time. Some screamed and some whispered. But they all tormented me night and day, day and night. I was dying on the inside and out of my mind on the outside until one day. A man named Jesus had come to my village. He was so kind and so compassionate. He prayed for many broken people and many were made whole. When Jesus prayed for me, everything changed. Every evil spirit that was in me and there were seven all left me never to return I was finally set free I was finally set free And that's why I followed Jesus as he went from town to town speaking and teaching on his power and his authority to forgive sin and the unconditional love that comes from God. I loved him because he first loved me. So you can imagine how I could hardly accept it when just a short time in Jerusalem when Jesus was recognized as the long-awaited Messiah that he was beaten. He was whipped. He was crucified on a cross. And he died. And it was Friday. As I watched Jesus' body being wrapped in linen cloths and placed in a sealed tomb. It was as if all my hopes and all my dreams were buried with him. We're buried with him. And then Jesus I remember Jesus saying to me, Mary, Mary. So on Sunday, I went to the tomb with two other women to anoint our Savior's body. And when we got there, we saw that the stone had been rolled away and as we looked into the entrance, we were greeted by an angel dressed in white. Do not be afraid. Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified, is no longer here. He has risen from the grave. I ran as fast as I could back to the disciples' home, Peter and John. 
they've taken our master, I said, and I don't know where they've put him. And so we all ran back to the tomb, and there we saw for ourselves the empty linen cloths. The disciples were stunned, and they returned home. But I, I stayed by the tomb, weeping. And as I looked back into the entrance, this time I saw two angels, one at the head and one at the foot of where Jesus' body was laid. This time the angel said to me, Woman, why do you weep? They've taken, they've taken my master, I said, and I don't know where they've put him. And when I turned around, I saw this man standing there. And he asked me, Woman, why do you weep? Who is it that you are looking for? I thought he was the gardener, and so I said to him, Sir, if you have taken him, please tell me where you've put him. And this man replied to me with one word. He called me by my name. Mary. There is only one who could say my name like that. Only one. It was Jesus. It was Jesus. He has risen from the grave just as he said he would. Yes. We can assume that her name, Magdalene, refers to Magdala, a town where, which is near Israel, or I should say near Tiberias in present day. Israel. But the most personal story that we have from the Bible about Mary is found in Luke chapter 8. There Mary Magdalene is identified as one of the women who supported the ministry of Jesus and the 12 disciples as they traveled across the, that area. They supported them from their personal resources. And within the context of that list, Luke fleetingly tells us one thing about Mary Magdalene. Here's how it reads. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out, Joanna, the wife of Cusa, Susanna, and many others. These women were helping them out of their own means. Luke 8, verses 1 through 3. Did you catch that descriptive phrase? Mary, from whom seven demons had come out. We're not told anything about how that demonic activity displayed itself in Mary. We don't know if she suffered from mental anguish or whether or not she experienced many physical maladies or whether she was trapped in some kind of sexual sin. We just don't know. But here's what we do know. At one time, Mary was possessed and harassed by seven demons until Jesus set her free. 
One day, Mary had an encounter with Jesus Christ, and everything in her life changed. You know, we don't know much about Mary's past life, but as, as you'll see in a few moments, we're told several things, several significant things regarding her life from the moment that she had that encounter with Jesus. That said, does her past life really matter? Are those details truly important? Isn't it enough to say that Mary Magdalene was transformed by Jesus from a demoniac to a disciple? Think about that. She was transformed from a demoniac to a disciple. That tells me, friends, that no one, no one is beyond Jesus' reach. And I'm grateful for the fact that the scriptures don't tell us much about her past. We don't need to know about her past. Sometimes, sometimes we restrict ourselves from throwing ourselves at the feet of Jesus because of our past. But we need to understand that when it comes to Jesus, he makes all things new. So the critical thing is not what Mary did before she met Jesus. The critical thing is this. At one point, at one point, the enemy, the devil, was pulling the strings in Mary's life. But when she had an encounter with Jesus Christ, that was over. And when she surrendered her life to him, she became his disciple, a follower of Jesus. So the question is, does Jesus still transform lives? And the answer is absolutely. That's what he does. That's what Easter tells us. Because he's alive, he keeps doing today what he did when he walked this earth 2,000 years ago. Jesus makes all things new. In fact, Pastor Kevin already mentioned it, but I invite you to come back next Sunday at 10 a.m. and witness for yourself a display of the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Come back and hear remarkable stories from people who were trapped in a web, but when they came to Jesus, when they surrendered to Jesus, when they stopped living the way they wanted to live and determined, I will come to the one who can change me, they have been set free. And as Kevin mentioned, our nation is in a crisis. And our nation continues to look for answers in all the wrong places. Because it's Jesus who can set us free. It's Jesus who can transform our lives. It's Jesus who can make us what we were supposed to be from the beginning. It's Jesus. All right. So the message of the resurrection is transformation. Why? Because as I said, he set people free then, and he sets people free now. He restored people when he walked on earth, and he restores people now. Back to Mary Magdalene. Jesus said that the one who is forgiven little loves little, but the one that is forgiven much loves much. From the one line description of her past, obviously Mary Magdalene was forgiven much and she loved Jesus much. After her deliverance, she became a disciple of Jesus Christ. Mary was present at the crucifixion. She waited until Jesus died on the cross. She was there when Joseph of Arimathea took the body down and they put him in a tomb. She saw that. She was one of the devoted women who came early on that Sunday morning to anoint Jesus' body with spices. And then, as has already been said, finding an empty tomb, it was Mary who ran to tell others, Jesus is alive. Mary was forgiven much, so she loved much. But but friends, isn't the bottom line that every one of us in this room who have experienced redemption through Jesus Christ, isn't the truth of the matter that we have all been forgiven much? 
that, that, that no matter what we've done, no matter what our past was like, whether the world would say, oh yeah, that was a bad past, or we would say, oh, I wasn't all that bad. The bottom line is that our sin separated us from God. We were rebellious. We were disobedient. We were living life on our terms. So isn't the truth of the matter that all of us have been forgiven much? Absolutely. And then shouldn't all of us love much? Yes. And Mary gives expression to that. Mary Magdalene teaches us how to, how to express that kind of love to Jesus. So Mary Magdalene teaches us to, first of all, follow persistently. Mary was the first one at the tomb that morning, and when she arrived, she was stunned. The huge rock that was there to seal the tomb had been moved, and immediately she went to get help. She, she, she went to Peter and John because she thought that someone had stolen his body. After Peter and John came, they looked inside the tomb, they saw for themselves, and the Bible says that they went back home. But Mary stayed there. Now, I don't think that Mary expected to see Jesus alive. Because even though Jesus repeatedly told the disciples, I have to go to Jerusalem. I have to face this death. And here are the reasons why. And then he told them repeatedly, but in three days, in three days, I'm rising from the dead. And those 12 did not get it. Or else they would have been there waiting. <laughs> They would have been there Saturday, okay, waiting to see that stone rolled away. So they didn't get it. So I'm, I'm not sure that Mary necessarily got it. But something within her wouldn't let her give up either. So she stayed. She remained. You know, friends, I think that people give up on the Lord far too quickly. Yes, yes. I'm talking about believers and unbelievers both. And usually the, the obstacle that causes the disruption is this whole matter of suffering. So I, I think it's a great Sunday to talk about that. Christianity is the only religious faith that says God himself actually suffered. Now, what good is that? To Jesus' followers who were assembled around the cross, it certainly seemed senseless to them. As far as they were concerned, there was no good in it at all. But in time... They came to realize that Jesus' suffering was of immense good to them and to us. Why? Because they would eventually see that they were looking right at the greatest act of God's love, power, and justice when Jesus died on the cross. God came into the world and suffered and died on the cross in order to save humanity, in order to provide a way for our salvation. His suffering and his death is the ultimate proof of his love for us. So, when you and I suffer, we may be completely in the dark about the reason for our suffering. It may seem as senseless to us as it did to the disciples when they saw their master, their rabbi, their teacher, this one who said he was the Messiah. It probably make, makes as, as less sense to us as it did to them when they saw him die on the cross. But friends, the cross tells us that when we suffer, it does not mean that God doesn't love us. 
it does not mean that there is not a plan at work on our behalf because his death on the cross is a demonstration of his love. His suffering is a reminder, a great reminder of his love. And although the disciples thought that all their dreams and all their desires and all their visions, they, that was over at the cross, we know that because of that Sunday, everything changed. The cross proves that he loves you, that he loves me. The cross proves that God is always at work, even when we suffer, even when we can't get the answers to our questions. He is still at work. The cross demonstrates that God is at work in our life, even when we can't make sense of anything. Mary persisted. She waited by the tomb. She refused to let outward appearances deter her from what she was seeking. She waited. She waited to see Jesus, and even though it seemed impossible, she stayed. She waited. Friends, please don't give up on God because hear me God will not give up on you All right. don't give up on God well what do I do pastor you keep waiting you keep waiting you keep trusting but I'm not even sure what I'm waiting for I don't know that Mary knew what she was waiting for but she stayed there. She stayed put. So we stayed put. We just keep doing the last thing God told us to do. And we keep waiting. And allow him to reveal himself to us, and he will. Mary Magdalene teaches us to search sincerely. You know, Mary didn't hide her feelings. She exposed her heart. When, when a man who she assumed was a gardener asked what she was looking for, listen to what she said. Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Think about what she's saying there. If you know where they have put him, let me know where he is. I'm going to go there. I'm going to get him. I'm going to bring him back to the tomb and place him here. Friends, come on now. This woman is saying to this person who she thinks is a gardener, I can carry an adult male body. Come on now. You know, we talk, come on, we all talk about you trying to lift somebody and you say something, oh my goodness, this is like lifting dead weight. No. I'll go, I'll go wherever. If you know where he is, if you know where that corpse is, I will go and I'll bring him back here and I'll place him in the tomb. This, this is a woman who was sincere and genuine. Friends, I think she teaches us to seek with sincerity, to search with an open heart, with a level of genuineness. Friends, listen to me. The Lord will always reveal himself. He will always, you write it down. Say, Cal Garcia said this. I'm going to see if he's really right. Well, I am because it's based on scripture. The Lord will always reveal himself to the sincere seeker. If you're a follower of Jesus and right now things just don't make sense, things look cloudy, you don't think that you see Jesus the way you had seen him a few months ago, he always reveals himself to the sincere seeker. You can bring him your emotions. You can bring him your hurts. You can bring him your questions. He can handle it. But you stay put and listen to what he says to you. 
He always reveals himself to the sincere seeker. You are a seeker. You haven't as of yet surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. Listen to me. You seek him sincerely, he'll reveal himself to you. Oh, preacher, how can you say that? Because God said that. He said this through his prophet Jeremiah. You will seek and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Amen. That's good enough for me. God says if I seek him with all of my heart, if I'm genuine, if I'm sincere, if I'm calling out to him, oh God, show yourself, help me, help me understand, help me to get a hold of this, open my heart, open my mind. He said it. I will reveal myself. If you seek me with all of your heart, are you someone who's longing for truth? Then I invite you to call out to the one. Call out to Jesus who said, without apology, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Call out to him. See how he responds. And then lastly, Mary Magdalene teaches us to report enthusiastically. <laughs> and when Jesus said her name, you know, she didn't recognize him. She thought he was the gardener. But when he said her name, Mary, and, and we don't know what that sounded like, but my goodness, it just, it, it just shook her down in her soul. It just grabbed a hold of her heart, and she knew, she knew, oh my goodness, this is him, this is the rabbi, this is my master, this is the one who delivered me. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's it. Because we never forget the voice of our rescuer. I dare say if I was drowning in some body of water, and somebody called out my name, and the person who called out my name is the one who rescues me from death, I dare say I'll never forget what that guy or gal's voice sounds like. And when she said Mary, he, she knew who that was. And, 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 and Jesus, Jesus then tells them, now listen, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take what you have just witnessed here. You go, you go find my brothers. You know who he's talking about, the disciples. You go find them. You go find them. And you tell them that I'm alive. And what did Mary do? Oh, Jesus, I don't know if I can do that. I'm a little shy. Are you kidding me? The Bible says she ran. She ran. And here Jesus said, tell the 12, I got to believe. I got to believe that whoever that woman ran into, she said, have I got something to tell you? Come on, friends. We get all excited because we had a nice vacation. Come on. Oh, you got to go to Miami and check out this hotel. Stop it. We need to talk about the fact that Jesus is alive. And wherever she went, I am sure that woman was saying, listen, this one who was dead is alive. This one who I thought they had stolen his body, he's alive. Yes. She reported it with enthusiasm. We need to do the same. So a few weeks ago, my middle daughter, Dianza, told me that Jesus has been doing some things in her life and that she felt like she should share a report with the congregation on Easter Sunday as a means of encouragement. So she sent me a copy. She sent me a copy of what she wanted to share and said, Dad, take a look and you let me know if this would work, if it would add to what you're sharing on Easter Sunday. So I did. I prayerfully read it and read it a couple of times. And then I called her, so I spoke with her in person. And I said, oh, Beyonce, you need to share that. And yes, it does complement what I'll be bringing on Easter Sunday. So you need to come, Dianza, and help me conclude my message this morning. Good morning. 
Thank you for the opportunity to speak on the best Sunday of the year. If you guys know me, you know that I'm pretty reserved and hard to read. If you don't know me, you're probably about to think that I'm the most open person you've ever met. My personal reservations aside, I strongly believe that the urging I have to share what I'm about to share is of God and that it will be used to minister to some people here today. So here goes. I had my first anxiety attack in October of 2017. If you've never experienced an anxiety attack, imagine the time you were most upset. The time you had your deepest cry combined with the hardest workout of your life. You can't stop sobbing, your body is shaking. You're sweating profusely and no matter how big a gulp you take, you cannot catch your breath. It's scary. And it makes you feel weak and debilitated and out of control of your own body. My anxiety attack was the culmination of months of waking up and going to sleep with a racing heart, inexplicable sorrow, and the inability to find joy in the things that used to make me happy. The overarching feeling that I had all of those months was that I didn't feel like myself. It is a weird feeling to be aware that you are separated from who you once were and to not have the ability to go back to it. Fast forward, and I had other anxiety attacks in November and December. They started to be a monthly occurrence. I felt like a true follower of Christ should not be going through this. If Jesus gives joy and peace and I sensed neither of those fruits in my life, then how could I really call myself his follower? I called out to God daily to please fix me, to restore my joy and make me less aware of my racing heart, to forgive me for being so weak and to please, please, please let me go back to the person I used to be so I could feel like myself again. One day, I was curled up on my bed, chest and knees, petitioning God to please help me. It was intense, like creating a one-foot diameter puddle of tears and snot on my sheets in tents. Now, up until this point in my life, my spiritual prayer language consisted of one and a half phrases that were memorized and that I could recite on command. Thanks. At my... But in that moment, at my absolute lowest and barest, the Holy Spirit imparted a fresh baptism on me. I spoke for more than half an hour in what seemed like a complete and full language. The Holy Spirit is God's peace within us, and God was gracious enough to give my concrete thinking mind a very tangible and physical reminder that although I felt as if his peace had left me, it is still very much at work within me. More than that, Jesus left a very important impression on me. He said, you think you don't feel like yourself. You think I don't understand and that I don't know what it feels like. And then he reminded me of this. When Jesus was on the cross, he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was essentially asking, my father, my very part of me, why have you turned away from me entirely? Why have you deserted me? In that moment, Jesus, the triune Savior, did not know a part of himself. He didn't feel like himself. Jesus let me know that he has experienced the hardest thing I have ever gone through, and he did it willingly in order to save me from my own sins. And he has done the same for you. There is not one thing that you have gone through or felt that the Lord Jesus Christ has not also felt. The difference is, though, he chose to feel your deepest hurt out of his incomprehensible love for you. God is doing something through me, and although it's incredibly hard sometimes, I'm grateful for his work in my life. I now believe that he doesn't want me to pine to be who I was before, when I was better, but he wants to break me down to my most fundamental foundation in order for him to build me into the person he has ordained for me to be. And I have faith that God will personally show each of you that he sees you and that he understands what you're going through and that he has marvelous plans for your life. We, have, we serve a faithful Savior who will never leave us nor forsake us, and I love him forever for that. Thank you. Shannon, you can come back. <clears throat> Mary was a woman who was transformed by Jesus. And so she teaches us how to follow him persistently, how to search for him sincerely, and then how to report what he has done for us 
enthusiastically Mary. This woman who we kind of know, but don't know. Has so much to teach us in our pursuit of him. You know, friends, we live at a time when there seems to be a lot of talk about reinventing ourselves to create a, a new style or a new persona to undergo so much change that things appear to be different. So we're told how to reinvent ourselves, how to reinvent our businesses, how to reinvent our careers. Reinvent yourself. I need to tell you something. Jesus, the Savior, the Redeemer, he doesn't reinvent. He recreates. Write that down. He doesn't reinvent. He doesn't take the, the, the stuff that's there and, well, let's, let's change it a little bit. Let's nip and tuck. So it looks like you're a different individual. No, the creator recreates. I love what I read in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ he is a new creation the old has gone the new has come the creator recreates he makes us what he intended us to be before sin messed that up he recreates us. He makes us. He, he designs us so that then we can fulfill everything that he designed for us to be and to do. I appreciate that line in Deonza's testimony. His desire is to build us into the persons he has ordained for us to be fulfilling his marvelous plans in our lives. Easter changes everything. The resurrection changes everything. So friend, regardless of where you are, if you need a change in your life, in your situation, circumstance, Jesus still transforms. He still makes all things new. If you're a seeker, and as of yet, you've not surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, it's no accident, it's no accident that you're here this morning. You chose to be here. You knew what we were going to talk about. How do you go to a Christian church on Easter and not know that you're going to hear about the resurrected Christ? What is it that God is saying to you? Is he pulling you? Is he drawing you? I say he is. Because he loves. And this morning... You're ready to surrender your life to Jesus Christ to turn away from doing things on your terms. That's really what sin is. Sin is living life on my terms with no regard for my creator. But if you're ready to turn away from that, that's repentance. Turn away from that and turn to Jesus and receive forgiveness and restoration. You could do that this morning. And we'll give you opportunity to do that. Maybe you're walking with Jesus, but you become a little distracted. You know, the things of this world have, have kind of uh, taken you away from that intensity that was once a part of your walk with Christ. You don't have to leave here the same way you came in because Jesus transforms. He can, he, 
he, he can place that fire back in your heart to pursue him with everything you have. Maybe you've walked through something that has caused your concept of God to change. He hasn't changed, but your concept of God has changed because maybe he didn't come through the way you thought he should come through. Maybe he didn't do what you thought he should do. And that has disrupted your walk with him. Let me tell you, he's the same because Jesus said that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if you would surrender that, if you would give that to him and just say it, just be genuine. Say, God, I don't get it. I don't like it. I didn't want this. And then say, oh, God, step in. Get me through this. Because I don't like what I'm becoming when it comes to my thoughts about you. Let's take care of it because he's the God who transforms. Or maybe you're a believer, you love Jesus, you feel like it's intense, you're pursuing him, you're running after him, you're thinking, I don't know if I have to go to those altars. Well, are you in a situation that you'd like to get out of? A circumstance that you wish would change? You're working it and working it and working it. Here, here's, here's, here's some counsel. Stop working it. Give it to Jesus. And ask him what his strategy is. You think your marriage is falling apart and you've tried all kinds of stuff? Stop trying all kinds of stuff and go to Jesus. Go to him. What do you want to do here, Lord? And probably what's going to happen is he's probably going to do something in you. Maybe it's a situation with a child or with a family member, a broken relationship. You know, friends, some of us walk with these spiritual limps and emotional hang-ups, and I ask why when Jesus is willing and able <laughs> to bring transformation. But we gotta come to him. He's waiting. He's ready, but we've got to come to him because he meets us as we humble ourselves before him and invite him. So let's stand. Let me pray, and then we're going to open these altars. And if you're new to this church or a church like this, when we speak about the altar, we're talking about this area right here, the front area of the church. It's an area that we designate for prayer, for people to come call out to God. And then we have individuals in the body that we have assigned and trained to come alongside and pray with people and agree with them, be a support and be an encouragement during that time of prayer. So at this church, we don't end the service without opening up this because we want to give people an opportunity to respond to the Lord. What is the Lord saying to you? And I would encourage you, if he's tugging on your heart, you come. You come. So, Father, we come to you in the precious name of Jesus. And we thank you that you're alive and vibrant. You're powerful and majestic. And you love us. You care for us. You hear us. You respond to us. You change us. You empower us. God, thank you. And Father, I would ask in Jesus' name that people, Lord, would find their needs met in you today. Granted, I pray. So as Pastor Shannon and the team lead us, come to these altars, we invite you to come. You need something changed in your life. You need something changed in your situation. You need to come and call out to the Lord. Invite him in. You're ready to surrender your life to Jesus Christ, to surrender to his love and experience the joy of sins forgiven and a new life in him, the relationship with the Holy God. You need to come to these altars. 
then I'm going to ask our prayer partners, you come with them, please. Come. And friends, if you'd rather pray on your own, that's your desire, well, we encourage you. You can kneel or sit around this altar area. But if you'd like someone to pray with you, agree with you, encourage you in prayer, then you remain standing around this altar area, and that'll be a signal to our prayer partners to come to you. Nobody's going to assume anything here. Nobody's going to assume anything. They're going to ask, how can I pray with you? And you'll share whatever you feel comfortable in sharing. And they'll pray and believe. So as they sing, you begin to come. And as I said, please, prayer partners, come quickly. Come with them. And Pastor Kevin, if you can help orchestrate what happens around the altars, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Help us, Pastor Shannon.